2014-2015. With a team resolved that the Philippine government will engage in an all-out war against the MLF and the IFF. I am Dr. Basoko, your MC for today. To start off, let us all stand for the prayer to be led to be led by Gabriel Agaspi and please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Let us remember that we are in the most holy presence of God. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty Father, we ask for your most precious guidance, Lord God, for today. We ask that our debaters may be able to answer and to set their, set their points straight. We ask, Lord God, for the strength and wisdom to be able to speak clearly and to be able to think clearly. We ask, Lord God, for a very good performance and program. Amen. St. John Baptist, let us all. Let Jesus in our hearts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you everyone and you may help take your seats. And in behalf of the Polsai class, I would like to thank everyone here today, most especially our judges, for sharing us their precious time to witness and judge, and judge the awaited time or debate of the political science class. Let us give them a round of applause. Now, in light of this debate, this will not be complete and we will not have challenging debaters of the Polsai class without introducing our very own teacher and friend to give his opening remarks. No other than Sir Matthew de Lesma. Thank you, Lander. Judges, debaters, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In the recent weeks and months, people have been talking about the issues especially about the fallen 44. You hear different opinions on how to approach this issue, this issue in our society our government is facing. Should we engage in a war or pursue or keep pursuing the peace talks? It is in this light that the political science class have decided to debate with this theme in mind. We saw that the Philippine government will engage in an all-out war against the MILF and the BIFF. In this debate, we will have a chance to hear both sides fairly and objectively. So debaters, good luck and God bless. Thank you, Sir Matthew, for that inspiring message for debaters. I think that will be a great spark for them to start later. Now, before the start of the, day, of the debate, it's better if we will know the mechanics and criteria of the debate, and after that, our introduction of judges that will be judging our debaters. To continue, we have Ken Atutubo for the criteria, and Spencer Go for the mechanics of the debate, and Carlo Yuguan for the introduction of the judges. Thank you. Mechanics for Paul Sai Debate 2015. Each speaker will be given three minutes to deliver their speeches, followed by the interpolation that will last for two minutes. The flow will be as follows. 
first affirmative speaker will construct will have his constructive speech, which will last for three minutes. The first negative speaker will then cross-examine the affirmative speaker. After which, the first negative speaker will have his or her speech, which will also last for three minutes, and the affirmative speaker will cross-examine the negative speaker. The same goes for the second and third constructive speakers from both sides. Afterwards, the rebuttal speaker from the negative side will give the rebuttal speech for a maximum of three minutes, followed by the rebuttal speaker from the affirmative side. The speaker may start at the first bell, wherein the timer will begin. A warning bell will be given, will be given at the two-minute mark, which will sound twice, and a final bell with three rings will be given, signaling the end of the three time minute. Thank you. is a high school English teacher and an old writer. He is an active member of the Santeros Writer Circle and many of his works have been turned into real and live performances. Please welcome Sir Jonathan Davila. Our second speaker is a grade 5 social studies teacher. She is also the level moderator for grade 5. She is currently taking her master's degree in education here in the University of St. Lazare. Please welcome Sheila Tikal. Our third judge is a reading teacher and is currently the department chairperson for reading. Please welcome Ms. Paula Schaffer. Thank you guys for letting us debaters know the guys on how they can win this debate. This is the most awaited part you've been waiting for. In a while, we are going to start the debate proper, but before that, in order for the debate proper to be successful, please avoid coaching, making noise, and kindly silent your, your gadgets. During the debate, in order for the debaters to concentrate in their speeches. Now let us start our debate, and I will give the floor to Sir Matthew Ledesma for further instructions in the debate. Okay, debaters, we will now start. First, the speaker, you will have three minutes to deliver your constructive speech. Please proceed to the podium. Good afternoon, judges, uh, fellow debaters, um, fellow enemy debaters, uh, Sir Matthew, and all my classmates. Um, I'm here today to give my first constructive speech. Um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. These are the words of the 16th 
President of the United States of America, Abraham Lincoln. Now, who is this house? It is the Filipino race, and because of the terrorist groups, such as the MLF, MILF, the Busayaf, and etc., Filipino soldiers are forced to are forced to kill Filipinos that have joined these groups, essentially dividing the house and preventing it from standing. In terms of the economy, the Philippines is barely holding out as it is. The Philippines does not allot much of the national budget to its defense sector, which means that our government is able to spend more money on sectors that can help our economy grow, like tourism. But what is the use if terrorism causes our country and other countries to issue travel warnings to their citizens, warning them that traveling to the Philippines is not safe because they might end up getting kidnapped. Foreigners, foreigners who want to stay away from the country, especially the Mindanao regions where the terrorists are most concentrated. Terrorism also discourages foreign businesses from investing in our country. What good is it being a country rich in natural resources if foreign investors are unwilling to invest in it. Terrorism not only affects foreign businesses, but also the local businesses as well. Bombings tend to happen in crowded places, such as plazas or markets, where people gather. This not only discourages people from going out of their homes or to their workplaces, but also inflicts damage to some businesses unlucky enough to be in the blast radius. Terrorism also affects our foreign trade. It increases the sense of insecurity and uncertainty of foreign traders in our country. It also increases transaction costs due to augmented security measures and can lead to the destruction of export goods like oil pipes. Countries affected by terrorism are less likely to trade with, other compared, with others compared to those that are not affected by it, mainly because it's safer. Okay, speaker from the negative side, you may now do your interpolation. Hello. Um, you stated in your speech that the military are forced to fight uh, Filipino people. Um, don't the military have the choice to, um, to engage in peace talks rather than to announce war against the other party? Yes or no? Well, um, let me answer that question by referring to um, an interview conducted by President by ex President Arab. Um, he said that the last time they declared war was during his term, and after that, there have been many peace talks and ceasefires um, between our government and the MILF, MNLF, BIFF, and other terrorist groups in the Philippines. But 40 years of that, nothing has really changed. Um, they still terrorize the Mindanao regions, and there's still a there's still a great risk to our national security. So, in regards to the military having the choice to engage in peace talks, they've done it already, but it has no, um, it hasn't really yielded much effects. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, but I only ask you to answer yes or no. Do the military have the choice to engage in peace talks rather than war against the other party? Yes, they do. Do you think war will develop the tourism in the Philippines? Yes or no? It will not develop the tourism yes or in the no, Philippines. Mr. Speaker. Yes or no, no, it will not. Thank you. Do you think war will make our economy rise? Yes or no? I honestly think it will make it rise because engaging in yes war. Or no, Mr. Yes, it will. Thank you. Okay, speaker from the negative side, you may now give your constructive speech. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A friend named Morihayo Shibo once said, To control aggression without inflicting injuries, the art of peace. Injury in this goal doesn't only mean the physical, emotional, and mental pain that art inflicts on people, but also the financial struggle that it creates. As people living in a third world country, it is not practical for us to engage and declare all of war to our own people. 
We stand as one and we are supposed to help each other, not to each other at each other. We are not only talking about those who are involved, but also those who are innocent, who are living their lives in peace. If power is declared, yes, we can dismember those who we consider as our enemies, but our fighters and defenders will also be killed as well. It would cost us up to millions of pesos and probably also thousands, if not millions, of people's lives. Neither the military nor the government has ever disclosed how much a massive military operation costs taxpayers. This has always been shrouded in mystery, but we can presume that the government diverts funding to these unbudgeted events. First tried us all at war, the, the military deployed at least two marine and two infantry battalions, or the equivalent of around 2,400 men, not just for days, but for at least over a month. Think of how many bullets and bombs they needed. Statistics presented during the cabinet office of the pres presidential advisor in the peace process or OPA, briefing for congressional leaders last 4th of August 2008, show that during the 1970-1996, the AFP spent 703 billion for arms and ammunition against MNLF and its sister groups, MILF included, on top of loss of lives and social economic costs. A Stratus All War policy launched last April 2000 resulted in an average of 20 million spent daily for three months, a total of 1.8 billion pesos. Despite heavy spending the offensive cost the lives of 431 soldiers and 624 wounded, the resulting deaths would have mean loss of potential income that could have been generated with the state combatants by their families. Moreover, infrastructure damage amounted to 202 million plus 125 million worth of agri products destroyed. To top it all off, billions of pesos were spent for war and no issue is still solved. More than body counts and direct damage, war social costs were even greater. The amount of money wasted on these actions could have been spent on development of our country. It could have been used to make more classrooms for areas in which they lack facilities. It could have been spent on the education of those who could not afford to support themselves. It could have been spent to support organizations that help with the better of our country's children. And also could have been of great help to the poor. The creation of all at war would not only cost us our people's lives, but also our people's hard-earned money. How much do we need to lose in order for us to realize that war is not the solution? To end my speech, I would like to share a quote from Thomas Merton. Peace demands the most hero heroic labor and the most difficult sacrifice. It demands greater heroism than war. It demands greater fidelity to the truth and a much more perfect purity of conscience. Um, so, Mrs. Mrs. Speaker, Miss Speaker, Miss Speaker, um, in your speech, you said that war costs um, infrastructure damage. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, infrastructure damage. There's gonna be some damage. Okay. Um, let's get it. There's gonna be some damage, whether there's war or there's peace to the infrastructure. Um, take for example bombings. So, okay, so tell me, with war, the infrastructure is damaged for a reason, for a cause. Um, but with peace, when there's bombings, the infrastructure um, is not really damaged for a just cause. So, what would be more, what would be more preferable, um, damage for a cause or damage without cause? I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but I disagree with what you said that. In peace, damage has no cost because it has. We are pushing through peace. And I think it's much better that the damage has a cost rather than not having a cost at all. So you're agreeing with the fact that damage with war, damage because of war is better than damage because of bombings? I said peace? damage with the cost, not war. The cost is not only war, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Um, so, how can you say we stand as one when most of the groups are made up of Filipinos, like you and me? How, how can you really say that? We are Filipino people living in one country, and we have the responsibility to stand as one and to help each other, not go against each other, Mr. Speaker. Yes, that's true, but what about the Filipinos in these terrorist groups? I mean... They don't seem to take a I believe they have a reason, Mr. Speaker. I believe we can talk it all out. Well, they may have a reason, but our army has its own reason, okay? So, yeah. That's it. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. We may now proceed to the first, to the second constructive speaker from the affirmative side. Please proceed to the podium. taking effect with a visible eye. If a single one of you believe that it is possible to live in a world without conflict, where everyone agrees, then congratulations. You live in a world where nobody, nobody thinks. Conflict creates progress and ironically, an understanding invisible to those who simply accept everything. It is a natural and avoidable part of life. None of us can stop war. We may be able to delay it, but it is bound to happen one way or another. Not only our government, but the whole world has foolishly decided that wasting resources on peace talks and negotiations is better than sim simply taking a situation into, own into one's own hand. None of us should ever negotiate with terrorists, nor even consider it. If we ever accept an agreement wherein a dangerous group would not reconsider their, their ideologies, then we should consider it a loss. War will always be present among us, whether you agree or not, simply serves my point. And if we consider about the thing that happened with the fall in 44, uh, during that time, there the people were already having like peace talks and such, but yet even behind their backs, they killed 44 people. So what does that have to prove about the peace side? Thank you. Okay, speaker, second speaker, you may not do your interpolation. Does conflict exactly mean war? Yes or no? No. How can you say war is bound to happen? When another party does not... Um, okay. When another party does not what you, can you repeat your question again? How can you say war is bound to happen? War is bound to happen when another party does not what they call negotiate or like when they're being aggressive and like the terrorist people they don't they stand by their point and never like uh, understand the other party. Yeah. Even terrorists have rights and they deserve to be heard. By engaging in war, would the fallen 44 be resurrected? They wouldn't be resurrected, but they, uh, their death would be just if, uh, justified. Like you're gonna be defending what happened to them because. What the MILF did to them was not right, no matter what. Do you think war is unconstitu unconstitutional between, uh, because you deprive people by the right of life, which was stated in the Philippine Constitution, Article 2, Section 1? Can you please repeat your question? Do you think war is unconstitutional because you deprive people by the right of life? I don't think so, because if we don't defend, because when they, when another party kills our people, we should always uh, let them know that we are not to be taken lightly and that they cannot just walk all over us by killing 44 of our people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, second, uh, second negative speaker. You may now give your constructive speech. We won't get justice by counting more dead. War is not and never will be the answer. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon to you all. Our nation has been familiar of the Mora Islamic Liberation Front, or the so-called MILF, and the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters, or the BIFF. For years, we have been dealing with this issue, and our government has been continuously finding ways on how to deal with it through peace talks and some negotiations. 
we've all heard about all of war, right? We all know we've been through this before, specifically during the time of our former president, Joseph Estrada. Why would we let history repeat itself when we all know the end result won't be a success? If we can't end this conflict, then I guess our government can prevent it from worsening the situation, and that is through peace talks and negotiations, not all of war. We live in a country where people matters more because we live in a democratic country and what benefits could people get if the government starts an all-out war? Article 2, Section 4 states that the prime duty of the government is to secure and protect its people. This line basically proves that the welfare of the people must be put first than the wants of the government. To add on, Article 2, Section 5 states that the maintenance of peace and order, the protection of life, liberty, and property, and the promotion of general welfare are essential for the enjoyment by all people of the blessings of democracy. Democracy, ladies and gentlemen, as what Abraham Lincoln said, it is the government of the, of the people, by the people, and for the people. So it basically revolves around the people of the country or nation. You might ask yourself by now, with all the things I mentioned above, what is the government up to that could save or solve this issue? The answer, House Bill Number 4994, or the Bangsamoro Basic Law. The purpose of this law is stated in Article 1, Section 3 of the bill. It states that the purpose of this basic law is to establish the political entity and provide for its basic structure of the government in recognition of the justice and leg legitimacy of the cause of Bangsamoro people. So basically, this law will help us in negotiating with the BIFF and the MILF as well. To sum it up, our government has other ways to settle with the MILF and BIFF. What I'm talking about is not through all of war. It is by the bill that some of our government officials, whom I respect, are doing their very best to pass this bill into a law. And basically, all of war is unconstitutional since it, since it goes against what is written in the Philippine Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that all of war is not the answer to our problems. We must support all of these, and one way of doing it is to support our government officials who are doing their very best to pass the House Bill number 4994 or BBL. We can't afford to, end, to lose any more lives. Thank you. Okay, time for the interpolation. Uh, before, we just like to remind that the first bill is just the warning bell. Okay? Okay. Um, so... Hello. My first question is, are you aware that some of the senators are planning to put a stop to the Bang Samora? Yes, I do. And are you aware that it was because of what happened to the Fall 44? Yes, I do. Can you explain that? In my opinion, I mean, I respect their opinion on why they backed out of the Bang Samora basic law, but I believe that the MILF were just protecting themselves and that the, me the media and some senators made a big deal out of it because the MILF were just protecting themselves and their families as well because as I know, the, uh, the MILF were doing a prayer service with their families when the, MI when the SAF invaded their territory. So it was like their instincts to protect their people so they basically made a big issue out of this and I respect the government officials who backed out but I, I, still, I still have hope on this, law, on this bill that it will become a law soon. So you're justifying that the killing of the MILF to the SAF is okay? That they just killed, massacred them? I didn't say it's okay but I was just saying that we don't know, maybe they were just protecting themselves and I, did, I mean it's not okay to kill people but we have the right to protect ourselves from danger like what the SIF did, the MLF. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We shall now proceed with a third constructive speaker from the affirmative side.
Ladies and gentlemen, guests, fellow speakers, judges, good afternoon. We from the affirmative side believe that an all war is a necessary course of action to stop the constant threats of terrorism in Mindanao. If an all-out war were to happen, a lot of lives would be lost, both for the military and terrorists alike. The government is constantly on the defensive and is unwilling to make the necessary sacrifices in order to achieve the peace the country longs for. Everyone is constantly crying out for peace, but if the government is unwilling to risk the lives of its men, peace will never be achieved. The whole country mourns the loss of 44 violent warriors who risked their lives for their country and fought till the very end. The rebels should be punished for their crimes and, and the only punishment necessary is death, as they do not deserve to continue living given what they have done to our country and its people. Soldiers, before entering the academy to train and become full-time military men, knew the risks involved and that their lives may be on the line. According to the pledge made by cadets before they enter the military, they will fight all forces that will destroy the freedom and independence of the Filipino people, that they are ready to die for the country and the true Filipino traditions of val valor, honor, duty, and loyalty, and that they will obey all laws, legal orders, and decrees of their legal superiors at all times. This means that they are ready and well prepared to lay down their lives for the country. The government should not be afraid to risk the life of its men because for peace to be present in our country, all threats to public safety should be eliminated. For peace to be achieved, sacrifices should be made. It would be ultimately better to lose a few men than to lose the lives of the innocent. How many more are they going to kill before peace is achieved? They should not be allowed to continue living because they are what make this country unsafe. Sure, this goes against Article 3 of the Constitution, which states that no person should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. But sometimes, there are circumstances when even the laws have to be broken and ignored because the greater good demands it. And after all, one of the goals of the Constitution is to, promate, is to promote the common good, and the death of the rebels will ultimately contribute to that achievement. The families of the fallen 44 cry out for justice for their loved ones. But for justice to be achieved, sacrifices should be made, and the government should be willing to make the necessary sacrifices for the safety of its people. The government should consider the bigger picture, which is the overall safety of the people. The few thousands that will die are nothing compared to the million other lives that are currently in danger because of the terrorists' presence. Peace agreements with the terrorists will ultimately fail because the rebels cannot be trusted to keep their word. The death of the rebels will bring nothing but good news as the death will signify that peace is now possible, but as long as those that continue to threaten the peace exist, peace is impossible. Currently, the rebels are the ones who are feared, but that should not be, as they should be the ones who are afraid of the government. The government should think nothing of the lives that will be lost in war, but instead focus more on the ultimate goal, which is the achievement of peace, the peace that will only be possible by sacrificing the lives of its men. Everything has a price, including peace. The government should be willing to pay that price. Sometimes, a little evil must be necessary for the achievement of the greater good. Similar to the events of Philippine history, our ancestors were able to achieve peace by spilling their blood on the battlefield as they thought less of the significance of their lives but of the ultimate goal, which is to claim freedom from the hands of the captors. The government should not be afraid to make sacrifices because if they continue to stand and let the rebels have their way, lives continue to be, lives continue to be on the line as the terrorists continue to threaten the innocent. Thank you. I agree with you. Um, how many more people do you think are going to die? Are should be killed in order to achieve peace? I think that the only deaths necessary would be those of the those from the rebel sides, and sacrifices should be made. As you said, Mr. Speaker, that you agree with my side, which means that you also want more, since peace, since for peace to be necessary, sacrifices should be made. Okay. Who gave you the right to punish two them? I have no. I am a political science student, I am not a government official, but I am stating that for peace to be necessary, the government should take the necessary course of action, which should be to declare an all-out war against the rebel group. How can you say that only a few people will die in an all-out war, with, uh, and the consequence is an all-out war declaration? Um, other, few people, not only a few people will die, but there will be great losses, there will be heavy losses, both on our side, on the military side and for and on the rebel group side, but for peace to be necessary, um, sacrifices should ultimately be made. And currently, and currently, the government should the government is not willing to make that sacrifice, which is why which is why it tends to it tends to focus more on peace talks. But how many? But actually, how many of these peace talks have actually succeeded in the past? None. Which is why an all war is the ultimate necessary course of action. Do you believe that? Killing is necessary in order to save people. Yes, I believe that killing is necessary to save people. Do you think it's fair for other people to take the lives of other people? Yes, because the lives that will be taken are the ones who take our lives as well. Since, since they don't respect our rights, why should we respect theirs?
Okay, let's now proceed to the construct third constructive speaker from the negative side. Peace and war are facts, but they are both good choices. War will last a long time. Although the government has lost, uh, the military has lost lives, we shouldn't try to lose more. Win or lose, people will die, and we wouldn't want that to happen. As one country, we must stand together. The unity between all of us would be broken when we engage into war against our own people. There is no winner in war. We kill the enemies, the enemies kill us. The lives of people, including the innocent ones, the children, the wives, the seniors, will be put to waste. As Christians, we don't have the right to kill our own, and we don't have the right to lay a hand on them. When we were young, we were taught the Ten Commandments. And the sixth of those commandments states that thou shalt not kill. This is my stand on the moral view of peace. With conflict at its peak, why add more conflict? Think about all the lives you're going to lose. Think about all the families that are going to be affected in the crosshairs of war. The Moro Islamic Liberation Federation, although not Christians, also have souls and deserve to live. All humans have the right to live, regardless of their religion. If we choose to go with an all-out war option, the war will not only hurt the Amayala, but will also scar them and their families for life. As humans, we have no right to kill or take away someone's life, nor do we have the right to afflict pain on others. We have all mourned for the passing of the 44 SAF soldiers. This was a huge mistake by the MILF, and this wasn't the only mistake they made. If we choose all out war, and if we somehow succeed in that, killing every one of them, the fallen 44 soldiers won't be resurrected. No matter what we do, do it won't bring them back. We just have to accept it and let go of the past. If we want to remove war, we have to replace it with something more irresistible. Peace and prosperity for all. Equal opportunities for everyone to achieve their dreams, respecting each other's differences while understanding that we are all fellow human beings. Acknowledging the complicated past, filled with grudges, and choosing to transcend it. As you said, as Christians, peace is always our main goal. And don't you think that peace has a price? Yes, I think it has a price, but there's always forgiveness. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but I think you're turning this debate into a CLE debate. We're talking about political science here, and don't you think that... It's the moral view of the peace talk. Uh, yes, but the moral view should ultimately lead to the greater good. So don't you think that the life sacrifice for peace to be achieved, we're worth it. Mm. Since the rebels don't respect the rights of our men, why should we have to respect theirs? Because they, as we all do, we all make mistakes, and that was theirs. So we have to learn from our mistakes and. Try to make our future better by not breaking them again. Isn't that isn't it that sometimes a little evil must be done to achieve the greater good? No. I'll take I'll take this I'll take this question into a personal into a more personal. If it were your loved ones who were taken hostage, wouldn't it be better to have the terrorists, the ones who are the reason why peace cannot be achieved, dead? Can you please repeat the question? If it were your loved ones who were taken hostage, wouldn't it be better to have the terrorists, the ones who are the reason why peace cannot be achieved, dead? I think it would be better if the, the military could handle it more because they, they're the ones handling the situation right now and I think they're not doing a good job. I'll rephrase the question. Who would, who would you like to see more dead? The terrorists or your loved ones? Because Mr. Speaker, you may, uh, as you may know... I don't want to see anyone dead because I support peace. As you, as you well know, the, ter the, terrorists, the terrorists take... 
um, take everyone hostages. And if it were your loved ones on the line, wouldn't wouldn't you wouldn't you agree with me that to have them dead would be better than to have your loved ones on the line? I believe that everyone should live. And no one has the right to take away someone's life. So, uh, dead or not, they're. Okay, time is up. We shall now go to the rebuttal of the affirmative side. You have three minutes. Terrorism in the Philippines are conflicts based on political issues conducted by rebel organizations against the Philippine government its citizens and supporters. Most terrorism, terrorism in the countries are conducted by Islamic terrorist groups. The most active terrorist groups in the Philippines are the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, Moro National Liberation Front, the Abu Sayyaf, and many more. As you can see, what happened last January 25, they violated the most basic human right, which is the right to live, as stated in the Philippine Constitution, Article 3, Section 1. Originally, a mission to serve arrest warrants for high-ranking terrorists it led to the death of 44 members of the SAF, 18 from the MILF, and 5 from the BIFF, and several innocent civilians. The cries for all-out war from politicians to the media to even ordinary people are loud and clear, a call to arms justified by the murder of the fallen 44. However, the negative side said that the government has already lost lives through war and that we should not lose anymore. But how many of our own people, innocent men and women of our country, are you willing to sacrifice? Are you are you willing to sacrifice? And how many more of them have to die because we are too trusting and gullible? How many more have to die because we believe in peace talks despite terrorist groups not sticking to their end of the bargain? History is more than a subject, dear speakers. It is a teacher, and if we choose not to learn from it, we will see more deaths than ever before. Think of the Philippine government. Think of the Philippine leaders as parents. Would your, mo would your mother and father negotiate with killers when their own children are being slaughtered in the next room? Being slaughtered in their own house? Being slaughtered in the one place where they were promised life, liberty, property, in the pursuit of happiness? Dear speakers, if you believe so, you should read up on Article 3, Section 1 of the 1983 Constitution. That is right. And also, the first speaker said that the government allots resources or more of its budget to travel instead of national defense. However, our speakers pointed out that tourism is affected by the terrorist acts and many are not permitted and it is even written on their passport and they are given warnings not to visit these places in the Philippines and it affects us negatively and our, economic, our economy cannot grow because of it. And what they failed to mention was that there is economic growth, economic growth through war. War can strengthen its economy by providing jobs. Also, war allows manufacturers to thrive, especially weapons and ammo manufacturing. In times of conflict, people buy more weapons and ammo, and thus more money changes hands, which benefits the people selling the weapons and boosts the economy. The truth is, although there have been 44 dead, the numbers have always been more than that, and there will continue, there will be more if we choose to be passive, all because we believe in the good of others without seeing the strength in ourselves. As George Washington said, as George Washington said, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace, and he is a man we should listen to because after all, he served more than 40 years in the Philippine, not the Philippine, he served more than 40 years as a military man, and his service can be broken off into three different armed forces. That is all. Thank you. Hello, my friends. Chop, chop. Wait, this. To the speakers and judges, good afternoon. War is a serious matter which involves too many sacrifices. And to answer the rebuttal speaker, Ma'am Mirano, the number is not 44 alone. As of 2012, 
The number is 60,000, and we haven't had the time to pray for even half of them, let alone report their deaths. Now, going on, as to why some Filipinos support this, I could say that some Filipinos have become tired of liberal democracy in general, that they're willing to support short-sighted measures to solve a problem that they perceive while ignoring the causes of the problem. That is why our group support the Bansang Moro Basic Law because we believe that any ethnic group residing in the country has a right of self-governance from a society which often excludes from the contemporary musings of the Filipino nation. Some have argued that our supposed Christian civilization as a justification of war, ignoring the fact that hundreds and hundreds of thousands died under the name of the Spanish monarchy and their god. Moving on to the first speaker, to the first speaker, if economics is all that is important to you, the numbers you don't know. As of 2012 and even before the death, during the time of Marcos, during his time with the MILF, there has been 60,000 deaths, 2 million internally displaced persons, 535 mosques destroyed, 200, 200 schools demolished, 35 cities or towns damaged. And if the economics is all that matters to you, 76 billion, again, 76 billion pesos worth of government spending on the war from 1970 to 1976, and 6 billion pesos on the war of era. And on speaker number two, it wasn't a massacre, ma'am, because a massacre, as defined with dictionary, is a ma as one party killing another party defenseless. defenseless. Just to make a point, both of the parties were armed. Going on, yes, there are many other government officials who support this, primarily Mayor of Davao, Duterte, and secondly, the past president, Fidel Ramos, who, take note, during his presidency, actually founded the SAF during, uh, under the PNP. Moving on, speaker number three, yes, I agree, but one death is already too many. Because one death is already too many. Because mainstream news is only about the side of the government. Have you heard about the side of the MILF regarding the casualties they sustained? Since the SAF forces were the intruding party, did you even think about the very high possibility that the MILF were caught off guard and were the first to attack the SAF, which led to a number of MILF deaths? Basing from the news, everyone, at the Sun Star newspaper, aside from those who died, there were also six, seven civilians, including a child, and three seriously injured in the crossfire. Moving on. Moving on, yes. The, MF, the MILF itself has already issued a statement regarding the incident and expressed sympathy for those who perish on both sides. Yet, national media talks only about the SAF as though the Muslim lives do not matter. Many morals for a very long time have seen their identity as oppositional to the Filipino majority precisely because of the centuries of oppression, land grabbing, political economic exclusion, and discrimination they've experienced from colonial powers in the Philippine state. The government should pay attention to what is happening in Bindanao. The Moro people, our peace-loving brothers and sisters, are lured by extremists with sweet promises. They need, most of all, they need more schools to educate the children, more hospitals to cure the sick, more motorways and waterways for their transport system, and most importantly, they need food on their tables, not bullets. Thank you and good afternoon. Okay, thank you debaters. May I just request you to please stay on your seats as we uh, tabulate your scores. Wow, guys, that was really an intense debate between the debaters. It was really a great fight, and I think the judges will really have a hard time deciding who will be the winner. While waiting for the results, on behalf of the political science class, I would like to thank our judges for sharing their time to be with us in this event. And as a sign of gratitude, please accept our tokens of appreciation. Please give them a round of applause. This certificate of recognition is given to Sir Jonathan D. Davila as judge during the political science class debate. And the winner is... We the team, we saw that the Philippine government will engage in an all-out war against the MLF and the IFF. 
held on March 2, 2015, as the Galeaga Theater, given this second day of March 2015. Same goes on for Sheila May, uh, Miss Sheila May G. Dicker and Paul, Paula, Miss Paula Asho. to the debaters from Cora Fala Fortune. The Sami Sato. Fernando Gurias. Gila Merano. Nika Ahoy. James Alves and Lasha Miranda. Thank you. I would like to request the debaters to minimize your noise. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Lander. 
Lonely, girl. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How was the debate? It was really okay. It was really an intense debate. <laughs> I believe in the saying that. <laughs> okay, good for you. So, you're in the peace side. Well, I think it is better. Never mind. Why? You're so biased. You're the master of ceremony. I know. Sir Jonathan, is it delicious? <laughs> Make me come. Miss Speaker, why did the boy throw butter up the window? Why? He wanted to see a butterfly. Yes! <laughs> oh, Lander, I want you to joke Master in English. Joke. Lander, yeah. joke something in English. I know it's hard, but you can do it. <laughs> It, it is really hard, Nika, so... <laughs> I have a prank, ha It's really hard, Nika. So, I'm going to Hi, my husband. Thanks for watching. I'm not a I know you're jealous, Thunder. It's okay. That's right. <laughs> Hi, Miss Pao. Let me ask, how's your Valentine's Day? That's from Kayla Miranda, by the way. From Kayla Miranda. While waiting for the results, please listen to the music. Thank you. They try to tell us we're too young. Too young. Too young. Too young. I pray to God every day that you give that smile. Um, Mary Brother Jonathan to sing. Cha cha cha. No, I'm not working on call center. Oh, I know. Yeah. Judging from the way you hold the mic. <laughs> <laughs> From Batch 1998. <laughs> <laughs> From Batch 1998. <laughs> 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 Let's 
welcome, Lander Bachoco. After 10 years, finally he's graduating high school. No, you're wrong, Ikan. After 40 years. 40? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. Sao ka lang? Ako po. Ako po. Let me ask Franco for you. Yeah. Will we in 
the visa. I mean, the best debater the visa. Honestly, I believe that I will win for the peace side because I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them be the way. Show them all the beauty that we have inside. Let the children's laughter remind us how we debate our selfie. Okay. 
And now we move on to the moment you've all been waiting for, the winning side. Take a seat, please. Okay. Are you guys ready? Who do you think it is? Obviously, you think it's you guys, so yeah. How about you, Sir Matthew? Who do you think it is? Girls call. First of all, we would like to thank our beloved judges for giving us their time and their expertise in the debate. Oh yes, 5 p.m., okay. The winning team, the best debate team, goes to the, 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 the negative side. Congratulations. And I, as their researcher, is going to join them. Sir, best researcher, sir. Best researcher. Thank you, judges. Best. Although there is one anomaly, they failed to award the best researcher, so, but I'm okay with that. <laughs>